This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here are your hosts, Jeff Deist and Dr. Bob Murphy. Welcome back, everybody. It's the Human Action Podcast, joined as always, or as mostly, by my co-host, Dr. Bob Murphy. How are you doing today, Bob? I'm doing all right, Jeff. How are you? Well, I thought of you when I saw this tweet recently by Neil Ferguson, our esteemed Scottish colleague. I guess he's out at Stanford at Hoover, I believe. I th- yeah, I think so. And anyway, he's written some great books, uh, some great history books on World War I, for example. And he also writes a lot about uh, the history of economics. So uh, someone had tweeted, there are no more than five people in the world who understand money. And Neil Ferguson re- responded favorably to this. Uh, and named someone who said, this person is definitely one of the five people who understand money. When I saw that, I was struck by the idea, why should money be so complicated? And it, it, it seemed to me that what he meant was only a handful of, I suppose, macroeconomists or monetary economists truly understand monetary policy in the broad sense of global money flows, uh, interest rates, global currency trade, uh, how currencies operate vis-a-vis one another. But nonetheless, it prompted an article by me because it, it just struck me that average people ought to be able to understand money. Mm-hmm. It's a daily part of their lives, right? I mean, if any of us undertook it, we could understand our automobile or our home construction, or all kinds of things. So first and foremost, um, I think there's a little bit of hubris involved here in a profession which would say that you, you know, mere, uh, you know, you're not one of the five people on earth who understands money. Right. I think that's rhetorically the, the point of those quips is to say, you know, I'm one of the five, you know, <laughs> but the rest you can fight over the other four slots. Um, and, and yeah, I agree with you. Obviously, with all these things, you, you only know up to a certain point. Like, I don't I'm not even sure how my toaster works if you really push me. But I understand the basic principles. And I think you're right. It's the same thing with money. And certainly what I think these guys have in mind when they're talking about that is yes, the, the complexities and, you know, how do you know what are the balance, you know, growth versus inflation and, da, 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 and those sorts of things, not, you know, what is a medium of exchange and why, why do we have money in the first place, which are pretty easy to answer. Well, obviously we're outliers to an extent in that we think money can be provided by the marketplace. It's a commodity with a pre-existing use. It doesn't need a policy. It doesn't need anyone setting interest rates. Um, most certainly most macroeconomists would dispute that. But nonetheless, I think it's this idea of monetary policy which has people befuddled. And I think it allows politicians to pull the wool over our eyes. I think that's the real danger here because policy is another word for politics. So I've never liked the term fiat money so much. I think we ought to call it political money. So we Mm -hmm. have political money versus market money. And obviously political money is ruling the day, but I wanted to throw something out to you, Bob, about you know getting our arms around what is going on, not just with the U.S. dollar, but with all money around the world. So I went and looked up a stat, Bob, on total global worldwide debt. So this includes sovereign national debts of governments. It includes corporate debt, household debt, individual debt, things like credit cards and uh, student loans and all that. So back at the outset of the crisis, in 2007, uh, this number was about $142 trillion. And then we had the Lehman Brothers crisis, we had the, uh, the uh, housing bubble, uh, we had all the events depicted in David Stockman's book, The Great Deformation, and everyone said, oh my gosh, we have a debt crisis and we have to solve it. Well, again, $142 trillion of global debt. Fast forward to today, it's more than double. It's $305 trillion. Uh, we, we can also talk about things like shadow banking. We can talk about unfunded pension liabilities at the national level, at the state and local level. But nonetheless, just official acknowledged global debt that's on someone's balance sheet as an asset is about $305 trillion. Now, I would argue that that has only been made possible by so-called monetary policy and just the tremendous amount of money expansion we've seen, especially since 2007. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and I, let me just make a quick point in case some listeners are getting hung up on this. Um, there's a s- school of thought out there that I think is wrong, just to be clear, that thinks that when numbers like you're citing, oh, it doesn't really matter because one person's debt is another person's asset and, you know, or liability and asset. And so what's the big deal? And it's just all double counting and da 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 da. And, and no, that, that's not right. That it really it does make sense to quantify and say, like, 
the total amount of debt on planet earth went up. Yes. Even though for every debt, there's a flip side and somebody else is the creditor. That doesn't mean it's just a wash. Like the system really is more vulnerable to a shock. If that's the way you want to think about it. just like with a given company, it makes a difference whether they raise their funds through issuing debt or equity, you know, and there's trade-offs. It doesn't mean the debt is bad per se, but there is a difference whether, you know, you have other people that it's put in money and they're, they're part owners and therefore, you know, you can weather a shock much better. Whereas if you just owe somebody money because you issued a corporate bond, that's a different sort of relationship and it's not equivalent. You know, at some level of abstraction, all they're kind of the same, but in the real world, they are different. They have different characteristics. So I just want to, in case some listeners think the statistics that Jeff was throwing out doesn't make a difference. No, they they do matter. And so in particular, you're right, Jeff. I think what what happened or part of the story is interest rates were very low by any metric, by any measure. And central banks around the world had something to do with that. It's weird that a lot of people sometimes argue they have nothing to do with it. And yet at the same time, they say, thank God we have modern central banks and we're not back on, you know, fuddy-duddy gold standard mentality. So so which is it? Are the central banks, do they save us from the crisis or do they have nothing to do with how interest rates were rock bottom for so long? So given that I believe the central banks had something to do with pushing interest rates so low, that explains why people, other things equal, would be taking on so much more debt. And there's cases I'm, you know, I'm sure you've seen Jeff. We talk about corporate stock buybacks where companies would be adding to their debt in order to buy the shares back. So in, in terms of making themselves even more leveraged and vulnerable, just to re- be reducing their outstanding equity while you know raising their their debt, that seems like it's a, a risky proposition. I don't know if you noticed, but this recent Berkshire Hathaway meeting just a week or so ago, Warren Buffett defended stock buybacks which I thought was interesting because he's got that sort of plain spoken, aw shucks right. demeanor about him. We don't need financial engineering. I, I invest in companies I understand and this and that. Mm-hmm. So it was a little interesting to me that he was defending this pro- process of financial engineering. But to your earlier point, at least if, if we believe that a debt load globally, which has more than doubled since 2007, also equals a corresponding asset, you'd have to be arguing that the world is twice as wealthy or more than twice as wealthy as it was just since 2007, which I think is not the case, for one. And I don't think that that's the case that anyone's making. But the one thing is very different, of course, from 2007 at the sovereign level, let's just look at our own national government, is just uh, debt service. So for many, many decades, debt service in the United States, in other words, the amount of money co- Congress had to authorize and spend to pay interest on all the outstanding treasury debt was very, very low. As a matter of fact, you just go back a couple of years ago, before 2021, uh, that debt service line item every year was well below $500 billion because you can go to, to a couple different fiscal websites run by the federal government. You can see that the, the total weighted average of all that outstanding treasury debt up until a couple of years ago was well below 2%. So Uncle Sam was financing its debts and I would argue deficit spending at a very, very low rate of interest. Well, now, if we go back to just 2006, uh, the average weighted interest rate on all outstanding debt was about 5.4%. So 5.4 versus, let's say, 1.6 is three, three and a half times. So if you put that in a blender and you take that that number, which as of 2021 rose to $500 billion, the amount that Congress spent that year. If, if you take that up to a more of a historical norm, three and a half times, you know, you're know you very quickly getting up over a trillion dollars in annual debt service, which would be the single biggest item in Uncle Sam's annual budget. That would be bigger than Social Security, Medicare, DOD, etc. So that is one difference in kind, I would argue, uh, between now the environment that we find ourselves in today as consumers and the Fed finds itself in, but also uh, the the environment 30, 40 years ago, is now debt service has not been an issue politically or economically for many, many decades. And now all of a sudden it is. So we've already got 10-year treasuries flirting with 4%. What happens if treasuries get up into that 5 6% range well, it looks like it's an absolute disaster for federal spending, and that some writers have termed this in the financial world the interest rate comet. So what do you think mm-hmm. about this, Bob? Yeah, I think it is a huge deal. Um, again, and I was saying this at the time, that back 
you know, 2007, 2008, when that started, the federal government began running amazingly high deficits under the Obama administration. There were four years in a row where the deficit was higher than a trillion dollars, you know, and that would just would have been inconceivable, like under the George W. Bush administration, when they had a few hundred billion. And if they cut taxes or, you know, people were just flipping out about how irresponsible that was. And yet America just got numb to it. There was, there was that issue. And then also because the world didn't end, they said, oh, OK, yeah, you, you right wingers or you fiscal hawks are always complaining about debt. But nothing bad happened. Interest rates didn't skyrocket. In fact, interest rates are at rock bottom levels. So, and so it it's sort of, uh, you know, the analogy I was use, used was if you have credit card offers and you keep getting offers to roll it over at zero percent, then you can rack up a huge credit card debt that way and it doesn't hurt but when those offers stop coming in the mail and then all of a sudden it resets to whatever it is 18 percent apr then you realize oh wow this was painful and that's where, where uncle sam finds himself now is that yeah they racked up a huge debt i mean it's the latest cbo figures by the end of the decade it, we're going to be at an all-time high that you know the debt to gdp you know debt held by the public is over 100 percent. it's going to be higher than it was even at the height of world war ii so back then, say what you will about whether the U.S. should have gotten into the war or not, but you can understand, oh, yeah, fighting in a world war for a few years, you might take on a big debt and then pay it down over time once the crisis passes. But now there's no crisis, the, the crisis that's going to just pass. The crisis is that Americans are getting older. And like you say, Jeff, oh, and interest rates now are returning back to normal historical levels. It's not that there's this one time shock that we just got to weather the storm and then we can have the debt go down. The debt's. Uh, projected by the CBO just keep rising. And again, not because they foresee any calamity. This is just baked into the cake. Even if nothing happens bad and we suppose there's another crash, which I think there will be, that's going to make it even worse. So yeah, this is, they have structural built-in problems. This, this you know, if you want to use the, the ocean line metaphor, we're heading right for the iceberg and they're not even doing anything about it. Well, the CBO itself admits or projects federal debt service of about $1.3 trillion within a decade. So this isn't something that we're coming up with on our own. I mean, these are knowledge numbers which are acknowledged. But I guess the question becomes, it's not so easy to just raise tax rates or to raise tax revenues. So it sounds like in the short term, as this interest expense rises, that Congress will just run bigger deficits. That's how they'll pay for interest, just like they've paid for all kinds of things, for especially the past few years. Right. Yeah. I think that's going to be the quote solution in the short term that it's going to be too painful and politically unpopular to do what would have to be otherwise be done. Yeah. To uh, cut spending or raise taxes, like you say, or, you know, they could start defaulting or do partial defaults. But again, that I think is going to be considered a nuclear option, uh, at least in the beginning. And so, you know, they, a lot of people say, Oh, well, they're going to try to inflate it away. And they, I, certainly, I think that's partly what they'll do also because the I, the mechanism by which they're going to hold down interest rates to kind of contain the pain mm -mm. is going to also be inflationary. And so that's you know one way to sort of reduce it. But even there, it would be one thing if they just were carrying this stock of existing debt, but they were running a balanced budget from here on out. And then they could just, yeah, that they made prices double, that would instantly cut the value, you know, the, the real value of the debt in half. And that's how they would get out of it. But because they have huge deficits built in structurally, even running the printing press, even if you thought that was ethically fine or whatever, that, that's not going to solve it fiscally. Well, there's actually an argument and a theory. It's called the dollar milkshake theory, which says that as these sovereign debt crises worsen or become more apparent on the horizon, just this global debt problem, there's so much more debt than there was before the 2007 crisis, there's so much more uh, sovereign debt than before the COVID crisis, especially across the Western countries, that there's a sovereign debt crisis looming. And as this crisis continues to loom, that's actually good for the U.S. dollar for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, that in, let's say, a recessionary global economy or an economy where there's people are worried about debt service, uh, that, that indicates danger. And so the U.S. dollar has always been a safe haven. And by dollar, I don't just mean actually holding U.S. dollars, but also U.S. Denom US dollar denominated interests or instruments or U.S. debt, U.S. stocks, for example. Uh, so that in a, in a rough or uncertain time, money flows into the U.S. dollar. That's, that's a big part of the dollar milkshake theory, but also that as sovereign governments for, in particular 
uh, want or need more and more dollars to uh, purchase U.S. equities, to purchase U.S. debt, or to just simply hold more U.S. dollars on their balance sheet. Uh, they, they have to print more and more of their own currencies in order to exchange for those things, and that this creates a bit of a race to the bottom. And so their currency is depreciating against the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is appreciating against their currency, especially when there's a carry trade, which we've seen these last couple of years, when, when rates were, when real rates, nominal rates on sovereign debt, uh, for example, in a lot of European countries was forced down below zero, even though U.S. treasuries were paying a very low rate, you know, one and a half percent or something like that, there was still a carry trade uh, between the two, between the delta uh, so if U.S. Uh, Treasury interest rates are just a little bit higher, there's always an incentive for foreign governments or foreign investors to uh, borrow in their home currency, buy U.S. equities, buy U.S. debt, hold U.S. dollars, and then pocket the difference. So all of this uh, debt debt crisis, all of this looming debt crisis is at least according to the dollar milkshake theory, which I tend to agree with, it's bad for big currencies like the euro and the yen uh, and the yuan, and it's good for the U.S. dollar. So in that sense, maybe Uncle Sam has a few more years or a few more decades even to play this out. Right. I, th I think that's probably right. And it's, um, I mean, that that's what happened like with Peter Schiff, you know, so he, he totally nailed going into the 2008 crisis. He totally nailed his predictions about the housing bubble, you know, all the structural problems of the U.S. economy. But if people took that to mean, oh, and the dollar is going to crash now and they shorted the dollar, well, they got hurt, you know, from the next decade. And I think it's because, like you said, that actually the crisis was so bad that everybody panicked. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it wasn't just that housing came down 20 percent or something like everyone freaked out. And then they actually perversely went to the dollar and treasury strengthened and so on. So you're right. I, th I think in the next global crisis, you'll probably see that happen again. I mean, one way of looking at it is, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a problem in Internet stocks in the dot com bubble. Then it shifted to housing. Then in 2008, you know, you, you started to see a problem with major investment banks. And so I think, yeah, the next crisis will probably be sovereign, you know, other central banks in trouble. And maybe, yeah, we'll get one more round where the Fed can bail them out and the backstop them. And that's how we'll get through that crisis. But then ultimately, you know, the last bastion would be the entity that's issuing the U.S. dollar. And when people finally lose confidence in that, you know, there's no one left to bail them out. People would rush to gold and silver, I guess, and maybe crypto or something. But I, I think you're right that there's probably one last hurrah where people, especially since the Fed did start bringing down its balance sheet in recent years. Um, so that they're, you know, I think they can say, oh, OK, they're not just going to keep printing forever. And so maybe the, the Fed has regained some credibility in investors' eyes. But um, again, it, it's I think, yeah, they might have just one last hurrah. But even there, they can't just keep bailing people out because eventually investors are going to turn even against them. Well, at the same time, they really have reduced the M2 money supply for the first time in decades, mm -hmm. in, uh, just starting last fall. So that, that's also new. There's a couple of things that are new about the situation in which we find ourselves that are different from, let's say, 2007. But let's, for a moment, let's set aside the inflation which has happened since COVID, price inflation. Mm -hmm. That is a result of supply chain disruptions or other uh, governmental things other than monetary policy. Let, let's just say what a, the, the, the inflation since COVID, which has resulted in price inflation. What's difficult for me as a layperson to understand is how is it possible for the U.S. dollar to appreciate against foreign currencies, which has done quite nicely since COVID for the most part, uh, but, uh, but also depreciate relative to stuff, goods and services. I mean, is that possibly our future where, yes, the dollar is the least badge, the least dirty shirt in the laundry, and you'd rather hold it than euro or yuan or yen or Swiss francs, but we're still experiencing price inflation as consumers going about our, our everyday lives. Well, well, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, like look back to World War One, for example, when all the major, you know, belligerents went off the gold standard. So certainly all their currencies compared to goods and services or gold were devalued, but of any, you know, among the basket of them, you know, some appreciated versus the other ones. Um, so I think it's a similar thing here. Yes. As crises continue to emerge, if all the central banks follow the same 
playbook and they inflate in terms of monetary policy, then yes, they would, other things equal, tend to, their currencies would lose value against their goods and services. But vis-a-vis -vis each other, the one that's considered the safest asset, that's where people would flock and they would appreciate against the other currencies. So that certainly can happen as we've seen it, it did happen. And that I would expect would be the pattern going forward. But as a political matter, is this now just completely unbound? Uh, everybody can't hold U.S. dollars. Some people on Earth have to hold their own currencies. I mean, I guess they can exchange their own currencies for U.S. dollars, but someone has to take that foreign currency. I mean, at some point, there has to be a technical or mechanical limit on, on dollar issuance. I mean, I, I'm just not sure that people understand... Uh, well, first of all, the privilege which we enjoy as Americans in, in terms of, of being paid in and holding our savings in U.S. dollar, the relative privilege at the moment anyway, but also the limits or the ends of that. And it goes back to my earlier point. Instead of calling it fiat money, we ought to call it political money because it feels to me like the U.S. dollar operates as an instrument of U.S. government policy. It's, a, it's, an, it's an instrument of governance rather than a, a, a traded commodity in the, in, the, in the sense that Menger and Mises explained money to us. Yeah, so a lot of good points there. The, a quick one, you know, you're right. Obviously, people still have to hold euros and yen and whatever, and it just the currency exchange rates would adjust. So yes, even if you could say, oh, other things equal, everybody would prefer to hold dollars than something else, but other things wouldn't be equal. If, if everyone's rushing into dollars, that would change the exchange rate. And at some point, they'd say, wow, the dollars is too expensive now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep my currency, even though I know it's going to get inflated. But, but away. would it? But would it? Or would people try to politically get around that with fixed rates and pegs and that sort of thing? Oh, I mean, some governments might do that. But then you know you run into you have shortages and things like that, and then people wouldn't be able to see. Know, they acquire. don't believe in any of this, Bob. What's that? They don't believe in <laughs> oh, any right, of this. They right. don't think that price controls cause shortages. I mean, there are lots of people who think that. Yeah, no, I know you're right. I was yeah, listening to an NPR story. Uh, uh, was it Venezuela? I can't remember if it was Venezuela or another country, but yeah, when it was really bad, and it was just so obvious, they were running the printing press and they had price controls, and they were they were dumbfounded because. It was the the military was supposed to be handing out like emergency rations, and then some of the officers were holding it back and selling it on the black market. And so that was NPR's explanation for why nobody had toilet paper was because of corrupt military officials, not you know. <laughs> so, well, but if money is unbound, if essentially the U.S. government can operate its printing press as a political matter rather than something that's subject to the laws of economics, where there's supply and demand for a, a commodity uh, or real currency derived from the market, um, then maybe this whole thing can go on a lot longer than anyone imagines. I mean, it's gone on a, lot, a long time since 1971, when a lot of people like Doug Casey were calling for some sort of hyperinflationary environment. And we got a little bit of that in the 70s, but, it, but certainly a dollar collapse, and we haven't seen that. Um, you know, the, the dollar as a political instrument is in effect a representative or a calling card of the United States government's uh, political, economic, and military might. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're so some of what Neil Ferguson was describing, I think, is this conflation between politics and economics. That's, that's at the root of what makes money so difficult and so hard to predict all of this. Right. So you made a few good points there. For sure, I agree with you that People on the right, uh, you know, hard money people, sound money people. We got to be careful because, yes, it sometimes does sound like, oh, that's it. The, you know, the dollar's done. And I've, you know, I've been guilty of this myself where I, I've been more worried about impending price inflation than actually turned out to be the case. Um, so there, there is that. So, right. Even though to us, hey, we can read the writing on the wall and this is it. If the rest of the world doesn't think like that, they can certainly limp along for a while. I would say, though, that this recent burst of, you know, consumer price inflation that we've had in the U.S., I think has reminded people that, okay, yeah, there are laws of economics. They can't just keep printing dollars and nothing bad ever happens, even though for a while after QE, it did seem like, oh, maybe it really is different in the modern economy. They can just create trillions and nothing bad happens. 
Um, so that there is that ultimate uh, constraint. And that, but in your other point too about like the U.S.'s military might and so forth, that's partly why I do think they're going to be on a tighter leash going forward than they would have been 30 years ago. Is you you already have seen other countries you know start to say, well, maybe we'll sell oil, you know, in terms of the Chinese yuan or whatever, and that the the scope of transactions for which the U.S. dollar is just the presumed you know default winner that's starting to shrink. And so I think especially like his other, you know, Putin and so on, they're forming new alliances, whatever, trying to contain the West or, or to contain themselves that using different currencies, I think the dollar's scope for that is, is not going to be unbound, in other words. Well, if we had another crisis on par with 2007, 2008 or worse, I think there would be calls for greater internationalization of currency because we have, you know, all these sovereign countries issuing their own debt, issuing their own currencies. And so we have these sort of currency wars, as Jim Rickards puts it. So there's a couple ways, I suppose, that that could play out. One, it could be we end up with a, with a global currency and a global central bank. That's what certainly some of the WEF, IMF type people would love to see. And the other would be that we have a little bit of a, a decentralized um, push towards a multipolar world. Obviously, the Chinese, the Russians, the Indians, maybe even the Brazilians aren't so thrilled with the U.S. dollar running the show. So that that's another scenario. But in addition to a, a couple of the structural changes we pointed out, in other words, things that are different now versus 30, 40 years ago, one of them is the upward pressure on interest rates. One of them is the amount of debt outstanding. Uh, but another one is the relative aging of Western populations and the Japanese population, for that matter, and the demographic issues in China. I, I, when I mentioned that 300 something trillion dollars of global debt, at least when it comes to our national government, that doesn't include pension liabilities. Those are off balance sheet. Those aren't included in the $31 trillion worth of federal debt. And some economists, as you know, Bob, have said, oh my gosh, there's like a $200 trillion shortfall in the future between likely tax revenues and likely benefits payouts. And what I mean by that is Social Security and Medicare. And then you can get even more granular. You can look at California, for example. They have over a trillion dollars in outstanding pension liabilities that they owe their state employees. Uh, I remember when I lived in San Diego, the city of San Diego is actually a pretty small island within a much larger San Diego County, which most people think of as San Diego. Uh, just the city pension payments every year to retired teachers, firefighters, lifeguards, etc. Back then, when I lived there, it was like $500 million a year. $500 million a year to pay retired people, retired quite young, by the way, to sit around and not work until they die. Uh, you know, it seems to me that some of the largesse that we've been enjoying as Americans uh, – cheap imported goods, low inflation, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that there are severe headwinds, you know, structural and demographic changes like the aging of our population and the entitlements crisis, that's, that's going to be a real challenge. I mean, we're not just going to be able to keep kicking the can down the road forever the way we have been. And so when we say, oh, Alan Greenspan was a genius or Ben Bernanke was a genius, maybe they just came along at the right time. And that their successors are going to have come along at the wrong time. Yeah, just to give it a quantitative uh, input on that, it's I was looking at that recent CBO report, and I believe they were saying by the year 2050, the mismatch between Social Security and Medicare, meaning you know in that year or you know around that year they did an average over a few years in that period, that in, incoming payroll contributions is the word they use, you know, coming out of existing workers' paychecks into those two versus the outgoing beneficiary payments was going to be about 5% of GDP. So like 5% of annual economic output would just go to covering the gap, not the, to the total payments, but mm -hmm. just the mismatch between the shortfall of So clearly they're not going to be doing that. What's going to happen is they're going to cut benefits, you know, raise the retirement age, do things like that and increase the payroll tax to you know take more from existing workers to pay existing beneficiaries so that they're going to do some combination. But again, just to sh just show how big that gap is. Even their own numbers are saying the mismatch is like $70 trillion in present value over like a 75 year horizon. So that, and again, that's not some crazy guy who hates the government. That is their own actuaries, their own uh, 
um, trustees in, the, in terms of the report, just to say what that mismatch is in present value terms. So, yeah, this is a huge figure. And like Jeff is saying, folks, that's when they report the official debt numbers, those aren't in those figures. The official debt just means like treasuries. So it's really um, and, and this is the kind of thing, too, where ever since I became politically conscious, like in the 80s, they were always warning about unfunded liabilities, but it was always something that was like 30 years away. Whereas it, it's now, it's already the case that they're paying more to beneficiaries than they're taking in, and they're whittling away the so-called trust fund. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think it's possible for the dollar itself to have a crisis? It's the world's re reserve currencies. Even our enemies have lots of dollars and own lots of treasuries, so it's not in their interests to have a dollar collapse. It might be in their interest to have the dollar slowly uh, lose value relative to other currencies. Do you think it's possible that we could ever have a dollar crisis? Or do you think it's possible that we could ever end up with a, a global currencies right, and a global central bank? Right. So for sure, I think what you're going to see is the push to get rid of cash that, you know, from whoever, whatever government level you're talking about that, where they have right now existing paper currency, they're going to be trying to like suck that out of circulation or suck the big bills out and keep just the little ones for change um, to try to move everyone digital. Like to me, that's they're obviously going to do that just because everybody from the you know elite perspective wins in that scenario. I think you're right. You alluded to it earlier. Like there is going to be some competition, sort of like the, the mafia groups vying for power in terms of, you know, not every not like Russian, the Russian government probably wouldn't be happy with if the IMF achieves a total global currency because they might think they're not going to have much to say in that environment. So maybe they're going to try to ally with China. Who you know, We'll see how that plays out. But I yeah, my prediction would be, yeah, you'll see crises hit the other central banks first. The dollar will backstop them, you know, the Fed. And maybe they'll get through that, but then it will be vulnerable. And yeah, I would think the IMF or World Bank would would come out with, you know, they have like special drawing rights and things, a basket of currencies of the major currencies and probably even have gold in there in the beginning just to get people to trust the thing. And then mm -hmm. once they mm -hmm. wean everybody off their own national currencies and get them on that, then yeah, they would phase out the gold, which is the, you know, the pattern that you saw at the national level you know, in the 1800s into the 1900s. So I would guess it would look something like that. But I think part of what's going on with it is that it's, there's not going to be like a dominant superpower. I think the U S influence is going to continue to, to shrink and China's is going to grow, but I don't think anytime soon China is going to be as dominant as the U S was, you know, like in 2005. Well, what I fear a lot more than a, a dollar collapse or a global currency under the auspices of the IMF or whatever, I fear a, a central bank digital currency. I think that is far more on the near term horizon. And that just equals control. That means governments can control our bank accounts. They can know where we are, what we're spending, uh, what we're spending on fuel or meat or whatever it might be. And they can also charge us negative interest rates. They can force us to spend in effect. So that that to me is a big concern. And the, you know, the, the other concern here is that, uh, the, the world is so politically uh, at odds that we do something stupid and throw human progress into reverse, uh, you know, maybe not through national autarky, but through some sort of regional autarky. I mean, it's certainly possible for certain regions of the world to get together and produce enough food or fuel or timber or iron or whatever resources it needs to just simply trade within a closed cluster and be self-sufficient. The problem is that we'll be poor as a result. I mean, I think, especially as Americans, as Westerns, we don't understand how much we wake up every day and benefit from global trade. I mean, those little $1 knickknacks at, at Walmart, I mean, it's easy to mock that and say China's evil and we ought to have an industrial policy which punishes them, but that's easier said than done. I mean, we are addicted to stuff and especially cheap stuff. So I'm not, I'm not so convinced that uh, a world that falls apart in a multipolar way or separates in a nasty way, maybe between the U.S. and the West and Russia and China, uh, doesn't get a lot poorer as a result of that. So, you, you know, the idea that we always go forward, the Whig theory of history, it just isn't true. We could go backwards and we could lose a lot of the really hard-earned benefits, I think, of global trade. And that's why I think neoconservatives are so insane 
in this, in, you know, they're very seriously pushing for a, an outright hot war with Putin or with China or with Iran, you know, protect Taiwan, whatever it might be. Um, that, that, that's one thing to say, but it's, it's quite another thing to do when Americans are already struggling with their bills. Imagine if consumer goods went up just that much more because we started to have this, this uh, global trade and all this cargo ships going all over two huge oceans uh, if we had that slow or even come to a standstill. Right. And let me just make sure the, the listeners understood that right before when I was saying the, the trend that I'm certain is going to happen is to try to get rid of paper currency and go digital. Right. I had in mind, you know, central banks issue digital currencies like that's that's what, why they're going to do that is because, yeah, they get rid of paper. And then, as you say, Jeff, that just gives them so much more control. So the vying over, you know, who's issuing it, whatever, like all the power players around the world are going to be happy with that trend. Because, oh, yeah, consolidate all your population, you know, with your central bank digital currency. And then maybe in 10 years, you know, we take you under our umbrella and, you know, bring you under a, a, a global one or something like that. This All of those things would be just so much easier from their point of view if it's all digital. Because then, you know, they, it's just a, a matter of electronically changing it. They don't even have to take, you know, collect the paper and issue new paper. Um, it's, it's then, yeah, as, as far as your other concerns, I agree with you, I think. That yeah, as you see the sort of you know, regional alliances. I mean, you saw it with the with the Brexit um, controversy, where they were threatening them and they were saying to the pro side, "If you go with Brexit, well, then you know, imagine all the tariffs you're going to face on European goods." And it was saying, "Okay, so you're admitting that being in in with you guys is not a free trade." You know, you know what I mean? That like that's how that threat worked was to say, if you're outside of our alliance of our currency region then we're going to have big tariffs on you. So um, I think you, you will see more of that. And also, too, like it explains a lot. Like, why is it that so many neoconservatives are for a carbon tax? You know, why does that? Why what do they care? They don't care about global warming or climate change. All of a sudden, they don't care about Mother Earth. It's because they thought, I would say incorrectly, that, oh, we that will help us with our, you know, machinations with the middle against the Middle East or whatever help Israel, whatever the, the deal is they want to do, because right now, yeah, we can't really smack the, them over there because we're so reliant on oil. Like, I think that was the thinking and why they thought, oh, we got to wean Americans off fossil fuels because then we'll be robust and we can go to war on a solid footing and not be reliant on that. You know, our, our people are they're whining about because gasoline is expensive. You know, that's the mentality. So I think especially in authoritarian regimes, mm -hmm. they will have that mentality and want to become self-sufficient so that they're not as vulnerable to, you know, the West's favorite tool of embargoes or block, you know, uh, trade sanctions. If you can just become self-reliant with your, the people in your alliance, then the, what the, the West loses that stick. Well, let's, uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. So I'm going to provide a couple links for this show. One to the dollar milkshake theory. You can check that out and see if you agree with it or not. I think we'll also provide a link to uh, Bob's book, Understanding Money Mechanics, which is really, I think, when it comes to CBDCs and other issues about global currency flows, is an absolute must. And you can just check out particular chapters that you might want to read in that. But also Th Thorsten Pollitt's new book called The Global Currency Plot, which we just published at the Mises Institute. We also have an HTML version, which is just absolutely fantastic in explaining how all of this works in a very concise way. So all that said, let's hope that uh, you continue to enjoy the dollar's uh, status as the world's reserve currency, our exorbitant privilege, and you can go out this weekend and buy some peanut butter or whatever you're buying at a reasonable cost. And uh, let's not forget, folks, there are people all around the world in places like Turkey and Venezuela who would kill to have only, let's say, 8 or 9% official uh, annual CPI increases. So thanks, Bob. Good to talk to you. And we'll be back next week with another episode of the Human Action Podcast. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.